All right, we're lucky to have Ricky Carruth here. I want to thank you, traveling all the way from Alabama. And I got to say the corny joke, you didn't get stuck in the mud, right? Or any... <laughs> no, it's funny. I was just telling you, I just left a podcast where they're literally, it's 30 minutes away. They're literally in the sticks. And you're like, that's okay. That must we're... really be crazy coming from you. But the thing is, is um, where I'm at in Alabama, I'm right on the beach. Okay. Right. So it's right where Florida, I'm right on the Florida, Alabama line. So the the beautiful white sandy beaches of Florida, Destin, Panama City, Fort Walton, Navarre, Pensacola. Oh, it, wow. it extends right into Alabama for a good forty miles or so. So we have literally like Caribbean type, you know, so beaches. It's not yeah. that rural. My cousin yeah. Vinny, Alabama, that everybody right, thinks right, of, right. Yeah, which actually so. wasn't even filmed in Alabama. That was in Georgia. Exactly. <laughs> Most exactly. people don't know that. Georgia's way more Alabama than Alabama, <laughs> but so I've heard. So I've heard. So that's it where is. I'm at anyway. I grew up there, and um, you know, I sell mostly girlfriend condos down there. Okay. But um, people don't realize that. So like, I just left Vegas and did a big event there. There was a thousand people and stuff, and. I said I was from Alabama, and in the slides, I had to have a picture of the beach. Okay. I was like, this is where I live, you know, because I know you guys have a weird image That's in your mind. That's a lot more similar to Long Island with the beaches. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And how did you get into real estate? So I was roofing houses with my father <laughs> as a teenager. I did that for like five or ten years. Okay. And um, I went to college. I went to four different colleges in two years. I flunked out of the University of Alabama. I failed a history class. And honestly, I didn't know what I was going to study anyway, right? Okay. I was just kind of there. I had a football scholarship in Missouri. And then, um, you know, it was too far away. I was 18. It was like a 20-hour drive. It was like, I can't, can't deal with this. So, and I always wanted to play at Alabama. So, or at least go to the school. So, I... Uh, I'm yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, just I... Like, just like, Yeah. Sure. <laughs> and so, I... Uh, yeah, I had a football scholarship to Missouri Valley College in Marshall, Missouri. Great. And then, but it was too far away. So, um, but again, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life stuff, you know, but, um, so when I felt that history class at Alabama, I, uh, I was like, all right, let me go, you know, real estate's one class. Okay. <laughs> it's yeah. like one class. So it was like doctor, 10 years, lawyer, 10 years, real estate, uh, one, one class. class okay. <laughs> so I was like, you know, all right, real estate agent has just as much or even more opportunity than a doctor or lawyer, but I only have to go to one class to, to get started. I'm going to take that. So that's kind of why I chose it. Control um, over your revenue and your own. Well, I mean, I, I didn't even get that far. I was just like, I want to be some, I want to do, I want to be somebody. But the I'm, unlimited income potential, that attracts a lot of people, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the income was part of it, but I knew real estate agents cause my mom owned a real, uh, owned a uh, hair salon. Okay. And she cut a lot of the uh, real, local real estate agents and political guys, cops and lawyers. She cut all their hair. And like I used to hang out in the shop when I was little because they didn't, we didn't, they didn't have anybody babysit us. That's where so all like, the talking goes on. We came, yeah, we <laughs> came to work. Me and my brother came to work with my mom and stuff. And that's how, I mean, honestly, that's how I got into roofing with my dad. He was just bringing us to work. And then, I mean, before long, we were like cleaning up the job site and roofing houses. But, um, Anyway, I knew real estate agents. Um, I knew real estate agents. They were friends of the family and stuff. And my my homeroom teacher in middle school's uh, husband was a very well-known real estate agent. And actually, one of their daughters was in the same grade with me. We were good friends. So anyway, it all kind of came together. I ended up going to work for him in the very beginning. and uh, But I got my life. I took the class. Funny story. I took the class and... Probably a longer answer than you want, but no, anyway, I, I took the class, for? and uh, my whole thing was, well, when I took the class, it's like, okay, once you get past the class, you got a year to take the test, then you got 90 days to find a broker to work under, then you got to pay, take your post license, da, 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 and I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> this sounds like way too much commitment, I don't even know if I want to do this, Yeah, you and know? you're giving me deadlines yeah, and timelines, like, and... I thought I could take my real estate license, and then like it's stamped on my driver's license like a boat. And then or I a could motorcycle just, you know, license. Drive around in case I need it. <laughs> then I could just go sell property if I want to in ten years, and I'm good. I didn't understand uh, continuing ed and fees and all this stuff. So as I realized that, I was like, I don't even know if I want to do this. <laughs> you know, like this is way too much commitment for me. And um, but I came home from college. You know, after I passed the class, that was my last class. 
And um, I went back home and I got back on the roof with dad for like four days. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to do, do real estate. <laughs> All right, I'm going to at least give it a try. So I went and took the test. Because at that point, I hadn't even decided that I was going to go even take the test. That's so how unco- just, that's how uncommitted I was. So it was like a waste of time if you weren't. Yeah, go I was like, I don't even want to take it. So I went home, roofed for like four days with dad, and I was like, okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to at least try this. So I took the class. I took the test. I passed the test. I got my license. You know, I had the interview. I put it under a broker, and I was like, see, you, dad. That's it. Like I'm retired from <laughs> roofing. Like I'm out of here, dude. Peace. Right. I go in the office and work full time for 30 days, sell absolutely zero. And I'm like, dad, dad, can I come like, back up? I need, I, <laughs> I need, need to come back. I need, <laughs> I, need, I need something to do. I'm fixing to like drown in bills. So, um, I went back to roofing. So like I roofed when I was a teenager, went to college to try to get out of that, went back, you know, then left. Cause I was like, all right, let me go do real estate. Yeah. Didn't sell anything. So now I'm back to roofing. Like it, it always comes Just back to roofing. Way. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, I got in because I wanted to help people. I thought, let me help first time home buyers. That's my passion. That was my first like thought. And then when I got in the business, I worked with like two or three first time home buyers and I was like, I don't want to work with home first time home buyers at all. Really? Yeah, because there there you there's so much you have to educate them so much more than a current owner who already has bought and understands the process and understands maintenance and utilities and taxes and closing costs and lending and rules and how to close. You know, when you take a person that already owns property, you literally cut out like 80 or 90% of the time you spend educating the first time home buyers on what the process is that I could then take that time to go spend to help more people instead of just focusing all all that time on one person. Because the other side of me is, is I, I'm, I'm constantly trying to become more and more efficient. Where can I squeeze everything. some time here to deploy into scaling more, you know, in another area? Where can it, you try and bring more value? So I ended up um, selling Gulffront condos, which was like the big money. Like, and they turn over so much. It's more of an investment. It's the gray area between commercial and personal because they buy it because it brings in money while they're not there. So that there's the investment factor. Mm-hmm. How much does it make a year? It's going to appreciate all that investment stuff. But then they also buy the condo. They want to spend time with their family at and make memories Correct. at the beach and stuff. Yeah, because they'll have a few weeks out of the year where they keep it for the owner value. And So it's really cool because it's like they, it's for me, it's like the gray area between commercial and those cold buyers that are only looking at numbers. But there's also the emotional side of it. You because know, you're where, going to get some... Because the people like, I really want this condo because my wife really loves this condo and we want to spend time here. So it's it's cool because it's like they're buying something they love that they're going to make money on. And so there's the cold side of it. And it's like it's like the best of both worlds. And all my clients are out of state. Well, I know exactly what you mean. I, so I, I never see them. Right. So it's it's like perfect scenario for me to be able, with my efficient self to be able to scale because I don't have to see them every day. And <laughs> you know what I mean? They're not popping by the office to you know, to check in on me and stuff. I'm able to actually spend all my time just grinding and talking to people um, about kind con- So I got into that over the first time home buyer thing. And I just kind of fell in love with that, that niche. How long know? did it take you to find that niche? Like a lot of people try on different hats and sometimes they wear them all, but immediately. So well, you went right, you went right all into mm-hmm, the, to the water mm-hmm. that you wanted to be in. Yeah. Yeah. Because like, that's what the guys in the office were selling. Okay. And so I was kind of learning from them. So like I was around other agents who were selling Gulffront condos. So it, you know, obviously uh, since I'm learning from them, they're teaching me how to sell them. Um, and so I think it was more the environment too, you know, and I saw how much money they were making and stuff. And I was like, wow, you know, th- this is, I want to be like these guys. Um, so after the 30 days, I went back to the roof. It took me eight total months from getting my license to closing my first deal. Okay. So I'm roofing and selling real estate, you know, all at the same time. Um, and this, so that was interesting. But, um, yeah, I finally got a deal. I closed two deals on the same day, my first deal. And then I kept roofing for, like, another couple of weeks, and I got two more under contract. And then when I got the next two under contract, I was like, okay. I think I'm going to hang gonna, my roofing, I'm gonna go my, for my it, yeah. roofing toolbox but, up. But, you know, to make a long story short, the funny part of the story is, is a couple of years later, well, I made a million dollars, and I'm only, like, 22, 23 at this time. And I start flipping houses and, um, 
you know, it's not a good idea. It wasn't a good idea in 2003, four and five because the crash, right? Yeah. So I ended up losing everything. They took my home, my car, cars, houses, you know, everything. I was bankrupt, sleeping on a friend's couches, sleeping on my car that a friend gave me, eating out of people's refrigerators and stuff. And I was like, Dad. Back. Huh? Had you battle back on that roof again? Yeah, I was like, Dad. <laughs> you know, but the thing is, is Dad wasn't roofing anymore. He was, uh, he had got into real estate by that time with me. I got him into real estate. And um, um, he went straight and worked on an oil rig when everything kind of crashed and burned. Mm -hmm. I went to roofing and I was roofing with just a random roofing company around town because that's really what I knew how to do. And um, after he worked on the oil rig for a year, I got a job out there. So now I'm working on an oil rig every other week. Anyway, I got laid off from the oil rig in 2008 and got back in real estate. So So I took everything I learned from losing everything. Right. And so the two things I learned that was the most important things that I learned was that when I was on that oil rig, I was I realized because I kept studying the market because I'm like, I got to figure out why I failed Mm -hmm. because I'm the most honest, hardworking, dependable guy. I know what if you can do it. Why did I fail? You know, and what I came up with is that um, sorry, let me turn this down. What I came up with was that. The clients that I was representing when things were great were still buying and selling when I was on the oil rig and on a roof, right? And so it hit me. I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's about people. If I had to maintain the relationship with these people, you know, then I would have been representing them instead of another agent during this time. They were selling bad assets. loyalty factor. Yeah, they were, they were selling bad assets and buying great assets cheaper, right? Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, right. I think I have, I'm on to something here. The other thing I realized was that closings happen every single day, forever, no matter what, no matter what, regardless of the market conditions, you know, dot com crash, 9-11, 2008 pandemic. People need to live. During all of those really incredibly scary times economically, there were unlimited amount of closings, right? So when I realized, okay, the market's never going to zero. And a lot of agents um, and mortgage people and everybody in the industry, there's a lot of people that don't understand that philosophy. And so they're kind of, they have a fear of the market, mm-hmm. but it'll never go to zero. I mean, it's what you're experiencing right now. So many people are fleeing. You'll have fluctuations where you have more transactions and less transactions, prices, all this kind of fluctuates, but it never goes to zero. Correct. Right. And there's always opportunities. And, and, and when you build your business around relationships with people and you build that database really large, where all these people love you, you're going to get, you're always going to have business no matter what. It may not be as much this year, the next year or more. That's like when the market exploded in 2021. Um, You know, a lot of agents and mortgage people did incredibly well. It wasn't because they did anything different from 2020 or 19 to 21. It was because the market kind of had the surge, right? (laughs) So the market will help you and deflate you like that will happen. Um, but it'll never take you to zero as long as you're continuing to build the relationships, talk to new people and you have a great system on the back end to kind of stay in touch with everyone. But after I learned that, um, and a lot of other things, I can, we can get into whatever you want to get into. Did you reapproach the first time home buyers when you, no, 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 no. I went straight for condos the second time around and it was a different conversation because before people could. I could make 10 phone calls, find somebody that wanted to make a hundred thousand. Mm-hmm. They would take me up on it and I would list it, sell it in a day, close on it. They made their hunt money. I made 20, 30,000. And then I never, they never talked to me. I didn't talk to them. They weren't going to rebuy. What was your, you, there was no follow-up system. Yeah, there was they, well, no they weren't longevity gonna, of the client. They weren't going to rebuy in that market that was inflated. They just made a hundred thousand. They're not going to buy something for a hundred thousand more than what yeah. they bought it they for. They just cashed out. <laughs> they cashed out. It was an investment. So they're, they're going back and, you know, that's it. And I didn't, wasn't worried about getting, staying in touch with them. I was 20 years old, making 30 grand. I could just make 10 more calls, mm-hmm. find somebody else, make another 20 But or they have grand. friends and they have a success story now to tell those friends, right? Yeah. I mean, um, those clients honestly probably didn't do anything until the market crashed. And then they were the ones that bought in 2007, 8, 9, and 10, right? Yeah. They called um, you back. But I didn't, I didn't think about all that stuff at the time, right? So, so the conversations I had were very cold in the beginning. It was just like, here's what we want to do. Here's, you know, the numbers. Okay. Sign here, get it sold, blah, 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 done. Um, when I came back and I had this 
different outlook, every conversation I had with prospects was completely different because when I talk to a prospect, um, I don't care if they want to buy or sell anything now, right? I just want to see if I can make a connection, see if they really feel like I care about them. Develop a good rapport, See if right? I feel like they care about me, see exactly what it is they do want to do, why they want to do it, and then everything else kind of falls into place. Whether they want to buy today, five years down the road, 10 years down the road, it doesn't really matter to me at that point. I'm just trying to build numbers of people who know who I am that's in the market that will use me when they decide to do something. I'm going to close deals now by doing that because I'm going to run into people that want to do deals now. And if they love me because they know I care about them because the way I talk to them, then they're going to do that deal with me. If they do a deal later, that's fine too. So the conversations were completely different. I was like, oh man, like I'm getting it, you know? So I built my business up by 2014 to 100 deals a year, single agent, did that for eight years in a row, one assistant, number one Remax agent in Alabama for, for a while, number one in my entire MLS all eight years. Um, that was with one assistant? Yeah. I'm, I'm beating 20, 20 agent teams and everything. This, how many assistants did it take you to find the one? That's, that's a pain I went point for like, a lot of people. I think I went through like three, maybe. Mm-hmm. I think this one I have now. She's been with me since 2014, the one okay. I have now. Um, to me, I find that one of the hardest things is when you get to a level of success that you want to duplicate yourself, finding the right person. That's 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 sometimes the biggest struggle. So. That's the biggest thing with agents that are making 100000 150000 You know, they're like, I want to scale it up to 500 a million. Yeah. I'm like, you know, do you have an admin or something? And basically, like most of them that are at that level, they say they have a transaction coordinator that mm-hmm. only does that little yeah. sector of your business. Correct. That's like they don't handle business all the stuff, right? Like you need somebody setting up showings for people that want to see your listing, setting up your showings when you want to show buyers, putting things in MLS, sending contracts to get electronically signed, um, helping your database, your follow-ups, all that stuff. You know, um, I actually still do do all that myself, but um, taking all that off my plate to where I can just focus on clients, you can't scale unless you have someone so, and that is a problem because the next thing they ask is okay how do i find that person right and it's i'm, I'm kind of like i don't know yeah it's that's like right? you know the needle in a haystack that most the people first one for. i had was like my dad's girlfriend she worked there for a while and then the next one i had was a uh like a friend that mm-hmm. i knew in high school and stuff you know, she worked for like a year or so, and then she got another job. She she was okay. She wasn't the one. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, what am I going to do? So, like, I put an ad out, and I found, and, like, I had a couple people come in, and they were horrible. I mean, just bad. Like, one of them was like, I can type so many words a minute. And, like, they came in, and, like, I could tell they did not even know what yeah. the keyboard was. It was yeah. nuts. It was like, how did you tell me you typed so many words a minute? And it's like, you don't ever think I'm going to figure that out? You like, can they teach could, a business. You cannot teach personality. They could not type at all. Oh. You know, it was like, at all. Like, <laughs> oh, not they, even they're, type. Yeah, they were oh. like, where's the letter type thing? It wasn't oh, I thought you were saying they could type, but they couldn't do anything else. But they couldn't no, even type. They all right, type. so we're, we're a little worse. <laughs> no, she's like, I typed this many words for a minute. And it was like, wow, you can type that. Like, that would yeah. be really good if that if you can really do that. Literally could not even find the letter on the keyboard. Oh, she you know what she I mean? speak that many words a minute. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but the one that I have now, it was actually, she was working for another broker in town. Okay. Like a big broker. And I got downwind that she was not as thrilled to be there anymore. So this is somebody with experience, you know, in the market, already knew MLS, how to navigate it, already knew a lot of the agents around town. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, my advice is, you know, just keep trying to find someone. And, you know, if you can find someone with some experience, yeah. you know, that's always the best, but I don't want to be in that position where I'm looking for <laughs> an assistant because that literally is the key because a great assistant will double your business overnight. Correct. A uh, bad assistant will drive your business straight into the ground. That's the problem. <laughs> and a so, lot of people, organic salespeople have trouble matching that sentiment that they, you, like you spoke about how you spoke to your clients. Yeah. That's something often that you can't teach. You can teach, well, the mathematics. You can teach the calculations. You can teach MLS. You can't sometimes teach people the approach, how to how to give a confidence and how to how to how to show loyalty, how to show that you're putting the client's needs first. All these things that when you're speaking, they're antennas that go up, especially if you're dealing with seasoned investors. These aren't 
you know, novice people that you could just, you know, put together a spiel for. So yeah. that's often, I, I find, is the biggest struggle. What would you say, what would you suggest people, like, what was the key to your success with your, well, when did you know she was the right person? Because you went oh. through three, so when you found this person, she had the experience. When, what, did you hear her on the phone that time where you said, yeah, she's got, she's got it. And not just the experience, but she's got your, she's echoing your sentiment. Well, um, you know, for me, um, you know, I never really put her on the phone at all. Okay. She might have talked to agents so about stuff. So she's not stuff. speaking to your clients. No, not at all. Okay. Not so, at all. So talk about that setup because that's something that really people – I mean, if you don't mind, that's – I think. Well, I mean, um, you, know, I, you know, for me, it's like I got to deal with all that, you okay. know. Like um, if somebody wants to see property, I need to understand why they're looking to buy. You know, I have to understand that to so make you keep to the client and keep exactly, to the exactly. So that that's kind of the thing for me is like, you know, the admin takes everything off your shoulders so that you can focus everything on people and your clients and relationship building, um, um, negotiations, you know, closings, showing property, um, things of that nature. You know, so my business is like this. I uh. My, my bread and butter, like my big secret sauce is a weekly email. Okay. Right. A weekly email to my entire database on the same day of the week, Wednesday, forever. I've been doing it since 2007. So literally in 2017, I quit prospecting altogether, continued to sell a hundred deals strictly off the weekly email, no social media, no direct mail, no follow up to see how people are doing. Nothing. Just complete, just servicing clients that are calling me that have known me forever through the email or done a deal with me or referred to me or whatever. Um, today I've got 19,000 people on there, 7,500 open it every week. So it's a nice solid brand there. It's yeah. a nice solid, um, you know, Avenue. Um, and so I still do that email. Like I've, you that know, been totally there layup. Right so like at this that. point back in March of last year, wow, I'm, more, I'm working on a year at this point, which is crazy to me yeah. that I stepped out of production. My dad at this point handles all showings, <clears throat> listing appointments, negotiations. So we finally got him off the roof. We got him off the oil rigs. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So he's doing that and it allows me to step back and just do social media full time. So I like, I'm full time creating, brainstorming, filming, doing podcasts and zoom calls and traveling and speaking and doing all that stuff full time. And then building other businesses on top of that brand, um, which is a much bigger opportunity. But um, he, he, so, so at this point where my business is now is, is I still do the weekly email. That's basically my only responsibility in the business in the, in the actual real time. outside of him and I consulting about deals. Cause mm -hmm. he'll call me and we'll talk about the deals and what we should do and stuff like that. And... Cause it's our business and he mm -hmm. wants me to have a say. So he, he makes the executive decisions most of the time, but he'll, so we work out every morning together as well. Um, at six o'clock. So we're able to spend that time together talking about life and business and deals and stuff. So that's really cool. That's so valuable too for the, just the father, son. And yeah, exactly. Like that's, exactly. You know, you he just started doing no, that. You can't put a dollar on that value. He just started doing that a couple months ago, probably five or six months ago. Cause his doctor was like, you need to start working out, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I was like, well, come to the gym. And like, he hasn't missed one day since. That's I'm awesome. like, shoot, like normally I'll miss a day like here and there, you know, mm -hmm. if I'm a little tired or something. We haven't that's missed a single day because I know he's going to be there and he's there before me every day. It pisses me off. Well, that's but, that uh, motivation. Now you got yeah. your gym buddy. <laughs> right, right. But, um, but yeah, he, he does all the, the back end like day to day and then she handles everything else. Um, but she doesn't talk to the clients. The only reason she would talk to the clients is if, if it's an owner that has a listing and we have to go through the owner to show it then she might talk to the client in that situation. Just for the appointment structuring. And yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I think people try to automate too much nowadays. Mm -hmm. Sometimes um, just that old school Yeah, I think voice on the phone, familiarity. Uh, yeah, exactly. I think that, like, you should take advantage of technology and the communication, you know, era that, that's come through. But if you can combine, if you can take the best parts of – this new modern world and the best parts of the old school, you know, world and combine those two into your business and kind of form your business around both instead of just trying to let AI and automation do every little piece of it. Um, or instead of doing everything on your own, then you would be super, super dangerous. And that's what I did. 
you know, and that's, that's, that's why I was so dangerous is because I kind of combined both old school and new school, um, you know, into my business. I'm probably still a little too old school, um, you know, on the real estate side, but you know, like I got a coaching program, right? Totally free. And we've had 50,000 agents go through it over the past six years since I've been doing it. And I've got agents that basically were new when it, when it started, um, that are number ones in their MLS, you know, whatever it is, you know, top five, top 10. So what I do and, and what I teach and how I built my business still incredibly relevant because regardless of where you get your leads from, you got to talk to them. Sure. And so my thing is, is how do we talk to them, right? What the real objective is when we're talking to them, what's our follow up? How do we make them feel special? Cause like if you, um, you know, it's like, how do you follow up with people in this sea of real estate agents to really stand out and stuff like that? And the real secret is, is the initial contact that like they first you, impressions. Yeah. You were like unforgettable to them. Right. And they like really felt like you cared and were super genuine and that stood out. And then you have a mechanism on the back end that hits them like mine's a weekly email, but whatever your mechanism is, then they never forget that first impression. And then they always kind of put you on a little bit of a more pedestal than just your everyday agent that's just trying to, Hey, would you sell your house today? It's like, you know, shut your ass. I'm going to slap your mom. (laughs) (laughs) So what would you, I mean, we're coming into such a different market, but you know, based on your, you've seen this market before, you, you know, you, you've seen the credit, you've seen the O3, you, you went through the thicks of it. So what are you, what are you taking, I guess, from the lessons that you learned back then? What did you brace yourself in for this, in this market? The thing is, is when you go through something like that, um, and you realize how these cycles really work, you don't really change much. You know so that, like that slow and steady wins the race. Yeah, mentality. exactly. You know that year to year is going to change. 2018 was different than 19, was different than 20, was different than 21, 22 is going to be different, 23 100%. is going to be different, 24, 25, they're all going to be different. So what does it matter, you know, if, if, it, it's a bit, if it's a surge like 21, if it's average like last year, like last year was average, mm-hmm. like where it's 5 million transactions and prices ended up the year higher than the year before, right? They're down from the highs, but year over year, we ended up higher than last year only like one percent or so right but still it's re- we're record Ex- highs correct. as far as like where we ended up at the end of the year on a yearly basis um so we're at like on a year-to-year basis record highs we had five million transactions last year that's just an average year i mean before the pandemic we were having four and a half to five million transactions a year um 2012, we had like four and a half million sales or something like that, Um, you know, which is what some of the experts are calling for this year. Um, That was a heck of a year. Like 2012 was just absolutely an amazing year. Trust me, I was there, I was building my business and I was like, man, and that's kind of what we're looking at probably this year. I don't believe that. Um, I think we'll have more transactions than that. Um, I'm getting messages right now from agents all over the country in the past week or so of multiple offers of lines around the corner for open houses of, you know, 15 showings first day on the market. Now we're at lower prices, of course, but the thing is, is as inflation comes down, 30 year fix is coming down, which is spurring people, you know, to, to want to, I mean, there's demand. We have more formations of families, right? Which people coming into their, their early thirties, more formations of families right now than we've probably ever seen. And it's going to continue for a while just based on the birth rates in the 1980s. Like, and that's true demand. That's people that need houses. It's not like people that want houses because they're tired of their house. They want to upgrade to something nicer. These are people that need houses. The condo might make it past the first kid, but by the second kid, you got to get out. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. So these are people that need houses and that, that real true demand is going to be there super strong this year and next year, the year after builders are down 30 per 40 percent you know they've cut back on production 30 40 percent so like the cost of everything is skyrocketed it's so tough to inventory of new houses is plummeting right um interest rates are coming down it's coming down with uh with inflation and just your normal everyday inventory is coming down i mean 65 percent of mortgages have less than four percent 24 percent have less than three percent interest rates right now those people aren't necessarily going to sell 
You know, they, they're, they're going to, some of them are, but like, we're not going to see a huge wave. Right. So with because formations they'd be paying more based on the, the uptick in the interest. Rates. And there, and some of them are going to be okay with that because they really want to upgrade or whatever. Correct. Right. Plus they can use buy downs and you can get a better rate. I mean, like the rates like 6% whatever mm-hmm. right now, you can get a much better rate. Like you can find a bank that'll do five right yeah. now. Like I know FHA people that, is into the fives. E- even, sure. even, even regular conventional loans. I'm hearing of people quoting around 5% on some stuff here and there. Um, yeah, it depends on the term. Yeah, you've definitely yeah, yeah. I mean, there's some incentive. And products. then, and then when you bump it down to a 15 year loan, you're really good. I mean, you can go out and get good more good rate right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but nevertheless, you know, they're still locked into a lower rate. You know, <laughs> and like the masses are gonna say, well, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep this, you know, yeah. 3.5, and I, I get it. I'm in like a 3.2 right now. Luckily enough, it's like our dream home we never planned on. Like, we closed April 17th, 2020. Like, it was during the 45-day yeah. shutdown. Um, but we bought the house that we plan on staying there, you know, until our daughter's, you know, gone. She's three years old right now. So, um, but anyway, like, what I see is, is people already starting to come out, right? 50% more people are Googling house for sale, houses for sale than they were back in November. Right. So that's an uptick in just regular online searches. And now you have inventory dropping that it drops this time every year till about February. Correct. Even in 2021, when the market surged, right, inventory went up, you know, and then back every year it goes up and back down, up and back down. And nobody really wants to talk about that. We're like half the listings we were pre pandemic. And now it's going to drop. And now buyers are coming back because interest rates are, are easing off. And now inflation is starting to get. So many people found a comfy, cozy spot right up on that fence slash. Yeah, the end. It was like a, a market exhaustion coupled with the increase in rates. And they were so tired from yeah. they were like, you know, the rates surge. I don't know what's going to happen next. And I'm just going to sit right here and see what happens next year. So it's like that first quarter so far, right, in 23, we've seen an uptick. We've seen more calls. We've seen more yeah. people getting back out there. We've yeah. seen, you know, oh, I heard the market softening. And I'm going to get, oh, can you update my pre-approval? Yeah, exactly. What's the rate today? I'm going to start looking again. I put it on yep. hold, you know. So it's like it, a lot of people kind of just go into the holidays. They hit Thanksgiving and they're like, they want to see their family, right? We went through COVID a few years. People didn't have that family, you know, atmosphere. And they were just tired. I, I find sometimes it's just human nature to just, you know, they were it. exhausted. <laughs> it needed it. You know, when you're paying 50000 more than the last, uh, than what they're asking, and you're getting zero terms, <laughs> you're paying all the closing costs, you're paying, you're, you're not even, you're not even getting the right to inspect the property. Yeah. You know, it, the market needed to. I mean, these people were waiting on lines in the cold and, you know, going back and forth, taking turns, going into the cars, warming up husbands and wives and putting the kids away. And, and I'm, you know, meeting my realtors and serving hot chocolate. And I'm like, we felt like we were in a twilight zone. We were, <laughs> you know, that's not normal. Yeah. yeah. But you know what? We're fixing to be back, not in the same position, um, in my opinion. I mean, rates would have to get back down where they were, like two, two and a half mm-hmm. percent or whatever for it to get that crazy again. But honestly, we're going to be in a similar type situation Come spring, when I it think. comes to supply and demand. Mm-hmm. Demand is so strong. And keyboard warriors on my videos, you know, you know, uh, demands, you know, 20 year lows and, um, you know, you're not counting in, in this and that, you know, it's going to crash so hard. Housing is done and all this stuff. It's like, okay, show me some data behind this, these statements, you yeah. know, because I show straight data in all my videos, you know, and they don't, they don't give me, I'm like, please give me some like real data, some numbers to go by. Cause I'm going by numbers here. You know, and they're like, well, mortgage applications are down a 20 year low or something like that. And it's like, well, this is going to happen in stages, ladies and gentlemen. If you spike interest rates higher, it's quicker than they've ever been spiked before in a market when prices are highest as they've ever been. Yeah. You're going to have a temporary slowdown. But, you know, let me ask you this. What do you think all these 50 percent more people searching for houses are going to do? Right. They're going to start filling out mortgage applications before long. They're searching Correct. online. Later, it's going to turn into physical showings. Then it's going to be mortgage applications. Then it's going to be pending deals and closings. It's going to take several months for this to start. To, to well, that's what I always tell people about appraisals. The appraisals are appraising the homes that went into contract four months ago, three months ago. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's, it is the lag in that as well. Right, right. But yeah. it, it's, a, it's a very interesting market that we're heading into. I think it's a very fun market. 
I think so too. I think it's I think it's one of the one of the um, most fun, exciting markets that that you know, the 2021 market came out of nowhere. I say came out of nowhere. I did a video in the complete shutdown that 45 days mm-hmm. we're locked down. I released a video like April 20th. You know, the economy reopened May 1st, mm-hmm. and um, I did a video and I said about to see the largest real estate surge we ever saw. Of course. I didn't understand how big it was going to be and how crazy it was going to be. It was really out of nowhere. Um, but what we're moving into now is totally telegraphed, right? That, you couldn't really tell what was going to happen. This, it's like the writing is on the wall here. Well, it's you know all relative, I mean? right? I mean, 5% didn't sound good when you're coming off 25 or 3%. It sounded atrocious. But now when we broke 7 in that you know, fourth quarter of 22, and people saw that the national average go to 7.19%, now 5% is looking a little more attractive, right? Think, <laughs> you know? Th- I'm going to leave this right here for the video, but I think that this year, we'll, well, I think we'll still hit 5 million transactions. I mean, and, and, and honestly, that's an average year. I From your lips to God's ears, let's take it. I think we're going to have an average year. And, the, and you know what's so cool, though, is that if you want to reach the upper echelons of the mortgage business or real estate agent business, right? Once you understand closings happen every day and the market doesn't dictate your success, okay, that'll get you to an average, you know, success. But to get to the upper levels of success, then you have to start paying attention to the market and start kind of betting on and preparing for what you think is the most certain outcome of the market, right? And so if I think 5 million transactions are going to happen, um, or if I feel like interest rates are going to come down with inflation, it's going to spur a lot of buyers to come out the woodworks at five and a half per when it fits five and a half percent, which I do. And inventory is also going to be plummeting until that happens. And we're going to run into basically the same kind of market we were in, just not as fierce. Um, I, and, and I go and I say, okay, to me, that's the most certain outcome. And then I prepare for that outcome and like put all my eggs there. What's so cool about it is if the 5 million transactions doesn't happen or the, um, the surge I'm talking about doesn't happen, the cool thing is is y- y- you're living on the surface, though. That's your backup plan is the fact that it doesn't matter if yeah. that happens or not. So you prepare for it. You go hard. Oh, what's the worst case? You sell more property. Now I'm overprepared. Even if the, even, yeah. Yeah, even if the surge doesn't yeah. happen, you still sold more than you would have sold if you wouldn't have tried to really go for it and really prepare for what you think is going to happen. And so – you really start to realize that this industry is a win-win. That there's no way that you can lose only if you start to kind of fall into the trap that the market, you know, your success is predicated on the market or, you know, that, you know, oh, no, interest rates. So, you know, or there's no need to really hit it hard right now because nobody's buying or whatever. Whatever you tell yourself, mm-hmm. that's the only way you lose, you know, is by. You have to take an active role. You know, killing yourself in the business. A hundred percent. Well, I uh, appreciate your time. If you have anything to leave us with, uh, words of wisdom for this. Uh... <sighs> I, mean, I know that, you've given me many. I that's given pretty me much many. Like, I just didn't want to, you know, hard stop you. If you have anything you want to leave us like, with. I mean, that could open up Pandora's box. We could sit here and talk. <laughs> we could, we could. <laughs> we could sit here and like really spit it for another hour or two, you know, as far as everything I'd like to say to but people out there. Time. I yeah. Know how no, it's nice to meet you, and Likewise. thanks for having me on, and, um, you know, keep doing what you're doing.